When you pity people who are sick, you take away their power. That I am sick, I will probably always be sick, and yet I am 100% content and happy with my life. 100%. But, and I have something called cystic fibrosis, but I'm actually not here to depress you all about cystic fibrosis. Um, I'm actually here to talk about how do we change the way that we treat sick people? How do we stop pitying them and we start empowering them? The way that our society works, we teach sick people that when they are sick, somehow, some way, they cannot be as happy as normal healthy people, right? We teach them that their happiness, their contentment in life, their joy in life is tied to how healthy we are. And I remember I was around seven or eight years old and I was, I, I was like flipping through this magazine and there's this really beautiful picture of like this artist in like their New York loft apartment. And I'm sitting there and I look around my hospital room and I'm like, I wish I was there. <laughs> and I had a moment where I was like, but I'm stuck in the hospital. And I thought, well, you know, there's a Target right down the street that has some twinkle lights and some throw pillows. And I have a room. I have furniture. Why don't I make something out of this room? Why don't I deck it out? So me and my nanny decided to completely redo the hospital room. And I don't mean like just put some pictures on the wall. I mean like completely redo the room. We were like moving around the furniture. I was like sweating. My machines were beeping. The nurses were coming in like, what are you doing? You're crazy. Um, and by the end, we had completely transformed the room. And nurses and doctors from all over the hospital came in to see it. And so every time I ended up going into the hospital, I would deck out my hospital room. I started to realize that people who are sick, and, and nurses and doctors as well, everyone in the medical community, everyone in the healthcare community, have, get so stuck in this notion that a hospital room is this cold, sterile, white place where we go to be sick, and that that's all that it can be. And we get so stuck in that that we cannot see the possibility. We can't see what we can make out of it. We don't see what we can do with it. I started realizing that our lives, in a way, are like this, right? Our lives are like empty hospital rooms. We get so stuck in the idea that, oh, it's supposed to be good or bad. Uh, oh, if we're sick, well, you know, that, then, it, then it's, it's cold and it's sterile, and we just have to live with it like that. And we don't let ourselves realize, we don't let ourselves see it. We can make that hospital room beautiful. We can make our lives into a piece of art. We all have that ability, we all have that capability as human beings to turn these empty hospital rooms, to turn these lives into something really beautiful. We look at people who are sick and we pity them because we believe that their sickness means their life has to be inherently less joyous than everyone else's. Life is not gonna stop unfolding itself to you just because you're sick or just because your life isn't how you think it's supposed to be. There's still going to be beauty. And I can honestly say a majority of the happiest moments in my life have been when I'm sick in the hospital. Honestly. And think about the implications of that. Because I have lived the kind of life that all of you spend your entire lives running from. I've been sick and dying my entire life, and yet I am so proud of my life. What does that say? No, really, what does that say about the way we're all living our lives? We're waiting to be healthy. We're waiting to be wealthy. We're waiting to find our passion. We're waiting to find our true love before we actually start living. Instead of looking at everything that we have, looking at all the pain, looking at all the sadness, looking at all the beauty, and making something with that. That's how innovation happens. Innovation doesn't happen because there's some person who's in a great circumstance and everything's going well and like, you know, and, and they just get on a roll and they make something for the world. Innovation happens, art happens because of suffering. And when we clamp down to that suffering, when we teach people who are sick, when you teach a little seven-year-old me that because I'm sick, I don't have anything to give to the world. I don't have anything to create. So 
I want to encourage you all. Next time you meet someone who's suffering and who's in pain, instead of shutting down, instead of pitying them, why don't you think, I bet their life is so beautiful. Really look at them and think, I bet their life is so complex and beautiful. We all get to be a part of this giant human epic story, right? We get to be a part of human history. We get to add to it. We have something to give. And we realize it's what we're creating that matters. It's what we're adding to this beautiful story that matters. When we start looking at that, we can change the world. Go ahead. So in our previous slide, we talked about sunburns. And sunburns are usually considered to be on the level of a first degree or possibly a second degree burn, depending on how bad the sunburn actually is. But in this case, we're talking about actual burns rather than uh, burns that are caused by ultraviolet light. A first degree burn affects the outer layers of the epidermis. They tend to be red or pink, dry and painful. There's usually no blister formation, kind of like with a mild sunburn. The skin maintains its ability to function in, to be a water, vapor and bacterial barrier and it usually heals in three to 10 days. We consider first degree burns to be superficial partial thickness burns. A second degree burn involves both the epidermis and the dermis. We divide second degree burns into second degree partial thickness and second degree full thickness. With the second degree partial thickness burns, it involves the epidermis and various degrees of the burn of the dermis. They are painful, moist, red, and blistered. Underneath the blisters is a weeping bright pink or red skin that is sensitive to temperature changes, air exposure, and touch. These burns heal in about one to two weeks. 
So think about some really bad sunburns when we're thinking about that, or some of the times that maybe your hand touched the um, grate in or one of the shelves in the oven as you were pulling something out of the oven and you got a blister on that on that area. Second degree full thickness burns involves the entire epidermis and the dermis. The structures that originate in the subcutaneous layers like the hair follicles and the sweat glands, they remain intact. These burns can be very painful because the pain sensation remains intact. Remember, in that layer, that's where the uh, nerve endings are exposed. The tactile sensation may be absent or greatly diminished in the areas of the deepest destruction. These burns will appear as mottled pink, red, or at times even a waxy white area with blisters and edema. The blisters resemble flat, dry tissue paper rather than the uh, bullous uh, blisters seen with superficial partial thickness injury. After healing in about a month, these burns maintain their softness and elasticity, but there may be a loss of some sensation. Scar formation is fairly common with this type of burn. Finally, with the third degree burn, uh, we consider these full thickness burns, and they extend into the subcutaneous tissue and may involve muscles and bones. Third degree burns vary in color from waxy white or yellow to tan, brown, very deep red, or even black. These burns are hard, dry, and leathery. Edema is extensive in the burn area and the surrounding tissues. There is no pain because the nerve sensor sensors have been destroyed. Full thickness burns um, wider than one and a half inches usually require skin grafts because all of the regenerative or the dermal elements have been destroyed. Smaller injuries usually heal from the margins inward toward the center. The dermal elements regenerating from the healthier margins. However, regeneration can take many weeks and leave permanent scarring even with smaller, smaller burns. One of the things that we use to evaluate how much of a person has been burnt, the percent of, of injury, is something called the rule of nines. And you can see in the picture that I've included how the body is divided into um, variants of the number nine. This applies pretty well to adults and even to older children. But with the very young, toddlers and infants, the, the rule of nines doesn't really apply and there's special rules that are used for figuring out the percent of, of the body that's involved for infants and toddlers. There's a lot of complications associated with burns. Um, most people think about the last one on our list of sepsis as being one of the major things since uh, skin is our first line of defense against infection. But hemodynamic instability is very common. Fluid is lost from the vascular, interstitial, and cellular compartments. Because of a loss of vascular volume, Major burn victims often present in the emergency department 
in a form of hypovolemic shock. Uh, we call that um, burn shock. Because proteins in the blood are lost into the interstitial compartment, generalized edema, including pulmonary edema, can be very severe. When we look, the other thing that we have to look at is when you've been in a burn situation, like a house fire or some other type of fire, uh, there's usually some kind of manifestation of an inhalation injury. And so usually we'll see signs and symptoms like hoarseness, drooling, and inability to handle secretions, hacking, coughing, labored, shallow breathing. Serial blood gases will show a fall in partial pressure arterial oxygen or the PO2 and signs of mucosal injury and airway obstruction often are delayed for 24 to 48 hours after a burn. One of the things that we are worried about the most is at, if there is a heat burn of the lungs or even smoke damage in the lungs, uh, patients can develop what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome. And we're going to talk more about ARDS um, when we talk about respi the respiratory system. So don't worry about, about understanding all the details of ARDS at this point in time. The other thing that happens with burns is that there's stress involved in the injury. And with that stress and loss of loss of the skin covering, we get increased metabolic and nutritional requirements. The secretion of stress-related hormones such as catecholamines and cortisol is increased in an effort to maintain homeostasis. Heat production in the body is increased in an effort to balance the heat losses from the burned areas. So if you think about it, you don't have that skin keeping your body temperature stable. Uh, you're losing a lot of, of, of heat from the body in this area of denuded skin. And so the body is going to have to try to use more energy to keep the body at a normal temperature. Hypermetabolism is characterized by increased oxygen consumption, increased glucose use, and protein and fat wasting. It's characteristic, it is a characteristic response to burn trauma and infection. The hypermetabolic state peaks at about 7 to 17 days after the burn has, has happened and the tissue breakdown diminishes as the wounds heal. Nutritional support is essential for recovery from a burn injury and it's important that that doesn't happen at day 7 to 17. It has to start from day one when that patient first gets there. Enteral and parenteral hyperalimentation may be used during this time to deliver sufficient nutrients to prevent tissue breakdown and post-burn weight loss. So in other words, what we're going to do is within 24 hours of when this patient comes in, they will get a solution of of um, TPN, or total parenteral nutrition, IV. So they'll be getting fats and vitamins and protein through their IV fluids. If they're able to eat, then they will also be given a diet that's high in protein because we need plenty of protein in order to heal. We also will make sure that there's plenty of electrolytes available 
uh, to replace what's being lost in the oozing and weeping of these wounds. So we have a question here. Treatment for third degree burn patients include all but which of the following? Definitely we're going to have fluid replacement. Definitely we're going to have removal of the dead tissue or the eschar. Definitely we're going to be on antibiotics to help prevent infection. The one that we have here that we wouldn't do is apply aloe. Aloe is not appropriate for third degree burns. So we were right. Aloe was the answer. Patients suffering from third degree or full thickness burns lose fluid through the skin and are prone to infection. They must receive fluid replacement and antibiotics to fight or prevent infection. Dead tissue or eschar must be removed daily, they get debridement, in order to prevent infection. Because third degree burns destroy the epidermis, the application of topical aloe would serve no purpose. So what we do with burns, since we really hadn't discussed this up to this point, is initially if you came upon somebody who had just had a third degree burn, we would want to find a way to cool the area that has been burnt. If we don't get it cooled down, it continues to destroy the tissue. So it's kind of why we do things like when we first get a burn, we stick our finger in our mouth because um, the our mouth is cooler. But the best uh, way that we would want to treat burns is to get it under some, some lukewarm water. Your book even talks about the fact that if somebody has clothes on, you don't want to spend time trying to get the clothes off of them before getting them into the lukewarm water. You want to get them into water right away to slow down that continuation of the burn. Emergency care at the site would consist of resuscitation and stabilization with intravenous fluids while maintaining cardiac and respiratory function. So if the respiratory system had been affected and somebody wasn't breathing properly, the EMTs would want to put down an endotracheal tube before the airway became too swollen. Once hospitalized, the immediate treatment regimen focused on continued maintenance of cardiorespiratory function, pain alleviation, wound care, and emotional support. After hemodynamic and pulmonary stability have been established, treatment is then directed towards the initial care of the wound. In many cases, nature's own blister is the best protection for many of these burns. Topical antimicrobial preparations like sil silver um, sulfidine and dressings are used to cover the wound when the blister has been broken. Wounds that will not heal spontaneously and tend to seven to ten days and those would be the deep second degree and third degree burns are usually treated by excision and skin grafts. The sloughed tissue or eschar, this blackened uh, tissue produced by the burn is excised as soon as possible. This decreases the chance of infection and it allows the skin to regenerate faster. One thing that we have to be careful about are burns that go completely around a limb. We call them circum circumferential burns. In other words, it goes all the way around. When there's eschar with these, we 
we uh, incise it. So in other words, we cut it uh, longitudinally. So if it was the upper arm that was burnt, we would put, uh, it would be cut from the shoulder area down towards the, the elbow. We do that so that as swelling is taking place, the cuts in that eschar allows for that expansion of the limb. If we didn't do that, then it would cause compression of the arterial supply to the, to the arm and also the venous return. And so somebody could actually lose their limb if that cut isn't put there. Sometime, and we call this cut of the eschar an eschartotomy. Sometimes a fasciotomy, which is a surgical incision in through the fascia of the muscle, is performed because there's so much swelling that's taking place that if that was not done, you would lose the blood supply to the limb. Systemic infection remains the leading cause of morbidity among persons with extensive burns. Continuous micro microbiologic surveillance is necessary. So in other words, you're gonna, we're going to be watching CBCs, we're going to be doing cultures to make sure that this person does not get an infection. In addition, we're going to give prophylactic antibiotic treatment for anyone who has major burns because with that skin removed, we've increased their risk of developing an infection. Also, there's various sources for skin grafts. And as we talked before with, uh, with the more extensive burns, they are going to need skin grafts to get uh, adequate healing and uh, of the wound. An autograph, and it's spelled A-U-T-O, graft, is skin obtained from a person's own body. So in other words, if the burn is on the upper part of the body, they may take pieces of skin from the back of the leg or the buttocks so that they can take the person's own skin for the skin graft. Uh, as we know, with any kind of transplant, there's, there's risk of rejection. So if we use their own skin, there's less uh, immunologic uh, reaction to this skin being moved from one part of the body to the other. A homograph is skin that's obtained from another human being, whether that person is alive or recently deceased. And a heterograph is skin that's obtained from another species. In many cases, this is pigs um, for burn patients. Another serious skin disorder are pressure ulcers. These often result from blood flow being obstructed from, from external pressure in the body. You can see in this, in this picture where those areas are most commonly found. Another reason for pressure ulcers to occur has to do with shear, which bends the blood vessels inside of the body and actually can cause them to tear internally. Obstructed blood flow leads to ischemia to the skin and we know ischemia means that we don't get oxygenation to the skin tissues. 
tissue damage from ischemia to the skin happens as well as friction damages the dermis and the epidermis uh, interface. When we talk about pressure sores, we give them a staging number. Uh, this has to do with the severity of involvement in the tissues uh, when the person has their uh, pressure sore. This particular example that I have included here is from the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, uh, and it's called the Pressure Ulcer Staging System. There's also uh, assessments called the Braden scores where we look at similar items to give a score to determine how what stage the uh, pressure sore or the ulcer is at. What I want you to get out of out of this is to understand what areas are involved with each individual stage. So we know that with stage one, we're looking at mild redness, we're looking at the skin levels. As we go into stage two, we're going deeper into uh, the skin and may even be starting to get into the the dermis. And as we go into stage three, we're getting into the subcutaneous tissues and may actually start to be uh, getting into some of the underlying tissues under the subcutaneous tissue. I want you to know the major ideas, the major areas of the skin subcutaneous tissues, uh, muscle, uh, and uh, bone areas that are being affected at each stage of the pressure sore staging. Treatment for pressure sores are changing dramatically. Um, sometimes it seems like from year to year. Obviously, the best treatment is prevention of the sores in the first place. Uh, but once there is skin breakdown present, we want to act in ways that will prevent further ischemia, reduce bacterial contamination and infection, and promote healing. Sorry, sorry that this says hurling. Not sure how I did that one. Um, in stage one, uh, we're going to do things like turning and measures to remove pressure on the skin. If we can do this at this lower stage, we can prevent it from getting worse. In stage two or three, we may be applying semi-permeable or occlusive dressings to prevent loss of wound fluid and to maintain a most moist environment for healing. In stage three and four, it may need debridement of necrotic tissue. Some of the ways that we do this are wet to dry dressings, although that is really going out of use. Uh, because of the other things that we can do that tend to work a little bit better. In some cases, we apply protolytic enzymes to the wound, and that uh, provides this debridement of the necrotic tissue. We may actually have to do surgical debridement, and in some cases, patients actually have to have skin grafts because the area is so deep and so um, destroyed by the uh, pressure ulcer at that point in time.
So your book was a little odd. I'm not quite sure why they didn't go ahead and talk about skin cancer when they were talking about exposure to ultraviolet light, but they chose not to. So we're going to go back to the idea about exposure to ultraviolet light. With sun exposure, it increases your risk of all types of skin cancer. The total cumulative sun exposure increases the risk of basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And you can see these pictures over to the side as far as what the basal cell carcinoma looks like. Kind of looks almost like a little um, kind of a cross between a blister and uh, maybe a zit that's coming up. Uh, probably about the size of a mosquito bite uh, in this particular picture. Intermittent sun exposure increases your risk of malignant melanoma, which is on the bottom right-hand corner of these pictures. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is of a Kaposi sarcoma, and Kaposi sarcoma, we think about it in relationship to HIV and AIDS. However, there's a number of other diseases uh, associated with Kaposi sarcomas, uh, but it, they are almost always associated with immunosuppression. So Kaposi's immunosuppression. Think about that. Uh, put those two together all the time. Malignant melanomas are cancers that are that arise from the melanocytes. They are very rapidly progressing. Usually what we see is asymmetry of the the lesion. So if you look at these pictures, when we say symmetry, we, we would talk about round or oval, that type of shape. But you can tell looking at the picture at the bottom that these really have no rhyme or reason to the shape that's there. We look at border irregularities. So instead of a nice smooth border, we look at that picture at the bottom and you can see all sorts of kind of wild, bumpy edges to this, this lesion. Then we look at color variation. Look how, this, how both of these lesions, there's no one color that's there. We see red, we see black, we see brown. Uh, so we get color variation. And then the diameter. Uh, usually it's greater than 0.6 centimeters. Honestly, you guys, these can be small. These can be 0.6 centimeters. To me, 0.6 centimeters is an awfully large lesion. And additionally, it, it's ever evolving. It's changing over time. It can start as very tiny and soon it's very large. What I can tell you about melanomas is I have a, my dentist that I grew up with in California had melanoma. From when he was diagnosed with his melanoma to the time that he died was three months. These things go, are very rapid acting. Um, my uncle also had melanoma. He had been doing construction work and roofing all of his life and so he was always out in the sun. He also was dead within six months of when they diagnosed his melanoma. It's just something that really is nothing to be messed around with. So there's different types of melanomas. The lentigo, maligna, um, it has more of a radial growth. 
Um, in comparison to the other melanomas, it's more slow growing, tends to be flat. The super superficial spreading uh, melanoma has also has radial growth. Uh, it has raised edges, uh, disordered color and appearance. It tends to ulcerate and bleed. The acrial lentiginous also is called radial growth. Uh, it normally appears on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, in the nail beds, and the mucous membranes. The nodular melanoma has vertical growth. So if you think about these other ones, they spread out on the skin but stayed pretty flat where the nodular ones, it grows up tall. And so it tends to be kind of dome-shaped, and usually the color is a blue or a black color. So our question now is, which type of skin cancer is associated with the worst prognosis? Basal cell, squamous cell, malignant melanoma, or ependymal cells. And the answer is malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma begins in the melanocytes and possesses all of the characteristic features associated with cancer. Asymmetry, irregular border, many colors, and a diameter greater than 0.6 centimeters as defined by the American Cancer Society. Basal cell cancer has the best prognosis and squamous cell cancer has a good prognosis as long as it's detected early. These next couple slides are going to talk about some of the disorders that happen on either end of our lifespan. This first slide talks about skin disorders of infancy. Uh, specifically, we're going to start out with diaper dermatitis, or in most cases, we consider this a contact dermatitis. It results from contact of the skin with urine and or feces. When we combine that with the warmth that's in the diaper and the chemical changes in the urine as it sits in the diaper, it becomes more acidic. And if you think about stools, stools have a lot of acid in them as well. So as a result, we have this acidic um, solutions sitting on the skin for a long period of time, and it makes a very red behind. This particular picture also has some signs of fungal infection, which goes along with diaper dermatitis because as the skin sets in this warm, moist environment, that's the perfect environment for yeast to grow. So it's not uncommon for diaper rashes to have a, a yeast um, element to it. So the treatment for diaper dermatitis is frequent diaper changes. We don't want kids just having di wet diapers on them for hours on end. Allowing the skin to air out uh, in many cases, when the skin starts to turn a little bit red, if we're able to let their little behinds sit out in the air, it takes care of the redness and, because it allows the skin to dry. Uh, also, barrier creams are really good at preventing the acids from sitting on the skin. Uh, in some cases, the doctors may prescribe a steroid cream to help reduce the inflammation that's going on at the site, or they may give topical antifungals. Another thing to think about, and your book really didn't talk about it, but as diapers are being made, different chemicals are involved with uh, the processing of disposable diapers. 
And so some people will find that their baby's behinds are more sensitive to one brand of diaper versus another brand of diaper. Um, the other thing that you could look at is if people are using cloth diapers, that we may find that the detergent that they're using, that the baby is having problems with the detergent, and uh, if they change to a milder detergent for washing the baby clothes, that there'll be less diaper rash after that. Prickly heat is a rash that tends to happen in younger children that have been exposed to a hot and humid environment. And basically because they're sitting there sweating all of, all of the time, it causes maceration of the skin by the sweat. So the treatment is to remove excess clothing so that they're not sweating. Cool off the skin with warm water baths, not cold, but lukewarm water baths. And then dry, dry the skin with powder to avo and avoid the hot, humid environment. Obviously, this is one of those things that we don't see as often as we used to see. Now that we have air conditioning and we can get kids out of the heat so that they're not sweating so much. But in the olden days, prickly heat was a pretty common thing. It's very itchy, so we try to get this resolved pretty quickly. Cradle cap is uh, an interesting uh, thing that happens with kids. And your book only gave one reason for this happening. But um, children that have atopic dermatitis will often have problems with cradle cap. And since I had a child who had atopic dermatitis, I dealt with this problem of cradle cap. And so a lot of the literature out there will say that cradle cap is caused by infrequent or inadequate washing of the scalp, or, but one of the other causes can actually be washing it too much. And by washing it too much, the natural oils are being removed and so you, you'll get this crusty scale formation. Uh, with my own child, we pretty much had to wash her hair every third day because if I washed it every other day or if I washed it, a four, let a fourth day go by, then she would have cradle cap. Uh, there is a lot of research out there that says we wash babies entirely too much. In most cases, babies aren't doing anything that's making them stinky or making them so that we need, you know, they're not playing in the mud or anything like that, that they're really dirty. And then we're changing their diapers and washing their behinds every time they do that. So what are we really washing on these kids? So the new recommendation, we, you know, that used to be one of these things that we recommended that babies get a bath every day. Babies don't need a bath every day. And in fact, you'll disturb the acid mantle of their skin and make them more prone to atopic dermatitis and some of these other skin disorders by bathing them every single day. But... The recommendation is about every other, every which would be about every two days to every three days. And if we do that consistently, we're less likely to see this cradle cap. The treatment for cradle cap is to use a mild shampoo and to get a small little soft brush and to brush those scales out of their hair. In some cases, some people will recommend that you take some baby oil and put the baby oil up on their head, and that softens those scales up a little bit 
so that uh, when you wash their hair, it'll be easier to get the scales out of the hair. If that's done, usually the oil is put on for about 10 to 20 minutes to soften those up. But basically, uh, you want to uh, get that thick, scaly, dead skin off of the top of their head. Something else, uh, like I mentioned before, if you have a kid that is prone to atopic dermatitis, they tend to get it. In some kids, getting cradle cap is an early sign of the development of atopic dermatitis. So I'm pretty sure you guys can't tell that I love babies and that babies are my thing since I've got two slides about baby issues. This next one is about birthmarks and your book divided them into pigmented and vascular. The pigmented ones are, a so, are an abnormal migration and proliferation of mel melanocytes in certain areas. And it specifically talked about Mongolian spots and nebis or moles. I didn't put any uh, pictures of moles. I think you all pretty much know what a mole looks like. But I wanted you to see what a Mongolian spot looks like. Mongolian spots are associated with people of color. Uh, it's very unusual to see a Mongolian spot on a, on a Caucasian infant. Uh, it can be as few as what we see on this top picture, or it can be almost the entire back covered in these dark spots. The dark spots will fade over time. We don't have to do anything to them or treat them differently. It's just something that will fade over time. Usually we find them concentrated over the buttocks, um, but they can be up on the shoulders like this uh, low, lower picture, or even out on the arms, or occasionally I've seen them on the chest. The vascular birthmarks are cutaneous anomalies of angiogenesis, and vascular development. So what we get is a profound number of little wound up knotted blood vessels. I wanted to talk to you guys about one that the book didn't talk about and we call them stork bites. Stork bites are like this one of the, pic the top picture uh, right next to the uh, picture of the Mongolian spots. Usually these little stork bites show up in the uh, forehead or, or on the temples and at the base of the neck. They normally will fade over time and by the time a kid is about one or two years old, you usually can't see them anymore. Uh, heat will make them more prominent. And in some kids, they'll continue to have them when they get older. Uh, I know that one of my daughters, uh, she had a little stork bite on the back of her neck. And when she would get overheated, even when she was five and six years old, it would still show up. It was kind of bad because I wanted to pull her hair up into pigtails to get it off her neck to help her be cool, but here was this big red splotch on the back of her neck. Like I said, they usually go away over time. Hemangiomas are the picture to your left at the bottom, and these are like a big knot of blood vessels. And often they'll start really, really tiny, and you'll just see like a little red spot. 
and then the next day it will look a little bit bigger and the next day it looks a little bit bigger and it's really amazing how fast these things can grow. There's really nothing that needs to be done to them. Uh, they usually will resolve on their own. Uh, they call it indurating when they get small. They'll get as big as they're going to get and then all of a sudden they just start collapsing and they'll go away. The only time that we really worry about these if it is if it's under the eye so that it affects vision, so that the, the baby isn't able to see. When it is in those areas, or if it's like by the nose and it might affect their airway, when it's in those air areas, then what we'll do is have them treated by laser so that they don't affect their visual vision. Port wine stains are this like the what you see on the right hand side at the bottom and um, they also are an area where there's increased blood vessels. Often uh, port wine stains are a little more serious than the other two because they're often asso associated with Sturge Weber syndrome. And with Sturge Weber syndrome, there is often loss of visual acuity in the eye where the port wine stain is around. And so you have to be really careful and watch for visual uh, changes and go to the ophthalmologist and have follow-up as far as that goes. In some cases where it's a milder uh, or smaller port wine stain, they may uh, do laser to coagulate those blood vessels and um, be able to get some uh, improvement as far as how they look. I had a um, church member that I used to go to church with that was a uh, family practice physician and he had a huge port wine stain on his face. Um, but he was also a very intelligent and very thoughtful person. So sometimes uh, you have to tr teach the children how to uh, have good self-concept uh, because obviously they look very different from their friends around them. I also went to school with, uh, with a guy that had a port wine stain like this as well. And uh, so you encourage the family to help the child have good self-esteem and to be able to accept their disability um, even though it's more of a a visual disability than an actual uh, physical disability that causes any difficulty uh, in them being able to do anything. Finally we have skin lesions in the elderly I really resent the, this because I've got some of these and I don't really consider myself elderly. I, I know I'm getting older, but I don't see myself as elderly. Skin tags are often caused by uh, rubbing of something against the skin and the skin will um, make a, a raised area where there's... Um, where, it, where the skin sticks up. Usually, most skin tags that people have are very tiny, uh, but can be bothersome because they can get caught on clothing. Uh, when they become very large, they can be removed if the person wants them removed. Uh, the actinic solar damages. Um, really you could come and look at my arms and pretty much see most of these on me. The seborrheic keratosis are benign. That's like this little 
this uh, man's head that's at the top of the page. And we see those quite frequently. They're a little um, raised and they can get dry and itchy. It'll make you kind of scratch at them and you can actually scratch them off and it'll bleed a little bit, but then it heals right back up again and comes right back the same as it was before. Uh, those are benign, uh, nothing to be worried about with those. The actinic keratosis is often known as a pre-malignant uh, skin damage. That's this arm that's just below the man's head. You can see these little red spots. They don't change color, they stay red. Usually when they see these pre-malignant areas, the dermatologist will uh, take those off just to make sure that you're not going to develop ca uh, cancer from those. And then we have what's known as solar lentinges or liver spots, which if you look at both the arm that has the actinic keratosis is, you'll see some brown spots on it. Uh, also, um, on the man's face, the ones that aren't raised, those are the solar lentinges uh, or the liver spots. Uh, definitely, if you're not sure about what we're talking about, come see me. I'll show you my arm and I'll tell you the difference between the two. Um, the vascular lesions that become a little more common in older people, uh, we get angiomas. Angiomas are these little red uh, spots. They are just a tangled mass of blood vessels, and they are completely and totally benign. If people don't like looking at them, there are special lasers that they'll, they'll just zap them and they go away, but they'll pop up somewhere else. Uh, so it's almost worthless to try to take care of those. I got a few of those as well. Uh, the telangiectasis are spider veins. And so what we start seeing are those developing on the cheeks, on the back of the legs, um, but definitely on the cheeks, we get these little fine spider veins. Uh, totally benign, but most people don't like looking at them. A venous lake is like this bruised type area on this woman's lip. And it literally is what it sounds like where blood um, goes into this area, makes um, sort of a a not a, a true bruise but a kind of cross between a bruise and a blister where it builds up under the skin it is also benign um, and they can treat those